It's a great pleasure to welcome you tonight to this organ recital, which is being live streamed from St. Malitus Catholic Church in Tollington Park, North London. And we're really delighted to have with us James Orford, who is the organist in residence at Westminster Cathedral, and tenor Rory Bowen, who are going to play and sing for us this evening and they'll be performing a program of music that is both festive and appropriate to the organ that we're celebrating. My name's Valerie Flessati and I've been uh, coming to this church for many years and I've been involved in the organ restoration project which is reaching a milestone this evening. It's a milestone because we're marking two anniversaries. The first is that exactly 100 years ago this weekend, the Hunter organ in the church was dedicated by the Congregationist community who worshipped here as their first World War Memorial. And it would have been a very solemn and emotional occasion that day in 1920 two wooden tablets were inscribed with the names of 46 men who had been killed in that war and 175 who came home. Their families would have been in the church, no doubt. And later, a few days later, the church would have been packed again for the inaugural concert for the organ. Fast forward 100 years and we can't have an audience at all this evening in the church because of COVID restrictions. So it's all the more welcome that you can take part online. 2020 is going to be memorable as the year of the pandemic, but for us, it's been also the year of the organ. And this is my second anniversary that this time last year, it was well past the point where you could patch up the wear and tear of an elderly instrument. The organ was completely unplayable. And yet, one year on, here we are with a fully restored organ, thanks chiefly to a substantial grant from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So tonight, for the first time in decades, we're going to hear the organ at its best. Breathing life or putting life into the organ has really been an act of faith and hope in the future. First on the part of the congregationists who left us this gift, and now on the part of so many people who've put energy and skills and hard work into restoring it today for generations to come. We are so grateful for all the advice and encouragement we've had on the way here, starting with the organ experts, especially Ian Bell and our organ building company, F.H. Brown, the Archdiocese of Westminster, three successive priests, a whole network of partners and local schools, our group of volunteer researchers and parishioners and special credit to the organ project team because they've been infinitely patient and infinitely inventive as COVID has forced changes to the plans. So it's been quite a long journey and a delight to be arriving here today for this recital. We do need still to do some fundraising and that's mainly because we've got a programme of community activities which will run into next year. So if you feel able to make a donation, that would be really gratefully received and very welcome. We're going to start the programme tonight with a short film to give you a glimpse of all that has happened over this past year. It's been a really collaborative achievement and effort and we've got a lot to be thankful for and to celebrate. So thank you for joining us and thank you to our star musicians, James Orford and Rory Bowen,
who will be performing for us. All you've got to do now is lift up your mince pie, have a sip of your mulled wine and enjoy the concert. We had this fantastic asset within St Melitis, this wonderful organ. It was broken beyond repair and we knew we'd need to raise some money. A bunch of us got together and said, look, we've got to try and save this organ. We're in a very interesting building because it was built in 1871 by a community of Congregationalists. By the 1950s, their numbers were diminishing and in 1959, this was handed over, bought by the Roman Catholics. And among the things we found out was that the organ that had been installed in 1920 was actually the war memorial, First World War Memorial for the Congregationalists. But what was great about this project was it wasn't just about this wonderful instrument. It was about remembering the men that the organ memorialised. The, the first person I, whose life I researched was a soldier called Arthur James Whedon and he was the fourth of five children. He died at the age of 34. He was serving in Betancourt at the time, and he died in quite tragic circumstances. He was actually not killed in the line of battle, but he was uh, involved in an accident with an Army Service Corps vehicle. Alfred Olford, who didn't at first appear until we realised that he'd emigrated just before the war, and actually he joined the Australian infantry. He suffered as a, at a gas attack and died um, near Rouen in April 1918. On the list of the soldiers who returned was a P. Alford, Percy, who's Alfred's brother. Both Alf and Percy were in that hospital in Rouen without knowing that the other one was there. And sadly, Alf died, Percy returned to his unit, and he only found out that his brother had died later on. exciting because we got this money from the National Heritage Lottery and that obviously paid for the capital works for the, for the organ to be restored but it also funded uh, a really extensive activity program built up through consultation with parishioners here but also the local community. They came up with some really fabulous ideas, for example free piano lessons. Through the project we've been able to give Joe Calder, uh, our trainee, um, some training and some work experience for six months actually in the workshop of F.H. Brown. doing a traineeship working at FH Brown & Sons which is funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. Before I was doing uh, AutoCAD design work in an office so this is a bit more practical and I thought it was a lot like what I should be doing. These are just general organ building skills that um, Joe's been picking up over the last few months and the idea is for Joe to after the six months to carry on organ building. All the pneumatic parts, the leather, um, were totally worn, worn out. We, we had to take most of the bits back to the workshop, the bellows, um, recovering um, new, new leather work. Um, and, and gradually we, we began to hear the instrument as we were putting the pipe work back in, um, hearing the stops really for the first time. <laughs> Um, some of my wedding photographs taken with Aileen, my wife. I'm looking forward to hearing the next time there's a wedding held here with the refurbished organ because it's, by all accounts, going to sound ten times as powerful. Even the present congregation won't ever have heard the organ at full capacity. Many of them will have moved into the area in recent years and won't even have heard it. So I think it's going to be a stunning 
um, moment of revelation when they do hear it. I think it'll bring the whole thing to life. It'll bring the whole thing to life. Um, it means a huge amount. Good evening everyone and thank you very much for tuning in to tonight's organ recital from wherever you are. Uh, it's an absolute privilege and pleasure to be giving the inaugural recital for this absolutely beautiful instrument uh, following its restoration this year. And my deepest thanks go to everyone here at the church who has worked so hard uh, during the entire project and also uh, in getting this concert to happen particularly uh, under such difficult circumstances. That was In Dolce Jubilo by Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, possibly one of his most well-known pieces, given uh, that it's played almost every year by most organists at Christmas time, um, and is also something to get the concert off to uh, a particularly rousing start. The next section of the concert will be all English music, uh, and will demonstrate some of the uh, solo qualities of the organ, uh, but also its accompanimental strengths. We'll start with two pieces from Percy Whitlock's Plymouth Suite, uh, published in 1939, the first of which, uh, the Lantana, will feature particularly some of the diapason and flute stops, 
uh, and then the salix to follow, which will primarily feature the clarinet stop. After that, I will be joined on stage by the tenor Rory Bowen, uh, and together we will be performing a song of peace from Charles Villiers Stanford's Six Bible Songs. Uh, the text is from the book of Isaiah, uh, but the piece is also particularly appropriate for this time of Advent because halfway through the piece you will hear the tune from O Come O Come Emmanuel coming in uh, in loud emphatic chords on the organ. And then af after that the snippets of the tune will be featured uh, right the way to the end of the piece. And then to close this little English section, I will be playing John Ireland's The Holy Boy, a piece which started life as a prelude for the piano, uh, but was later rearranged for the organ. Uh, and during this piece, uh, the string stops of the organ will be featured primarily. So I hope you enjoy this section. Uh, and this is Percy Whitlock's Lantana.
now we come to the final section of the program, which is altogether a little bit lighter and uh, certainly more popular than uh, some of those pieces were. Um, we start with uh, Cottrell's Santa Lucia, a piece I'm sure will be very familiar uh, to many of you. Um, this, of course, is Gaudete Sunday, uh, but it is also uh, St. Lucy's Day, and so we thought it would be a nice thing uh, to honour her uh, with this piece. Uh, then I will be playing the finale from Louis Vienne's first symphony, uh, which is a wonderfully energetic, joyous piece, and for that reason uh, often gets played uh, around Christmas time uh, at the end of carol services, uh, etc. And then to wrap up tonight's concert, we will be performing O Holy Night to send you off into the evening. Um, I hope you enjoyed the concert. Uh, thank you very much once again for tuning in and uh, we wish you a very happy Christmas and New Year.